uh, is here anyone who prefer uh, boring English over the nice Czech language? Yeah, any English? Okay, so let's say <laughs> it's your choice. Um, <laughs> if you will not understand. <laughs> so we should talk about how to configure JBoss application server seven or enterprise application server to, to work with uh, Kerberos. Who of you uses Kerberos in company, in school? I think most of you. And whoever tried to configure Kerberos server or services in Kerberos? Yeah, here, few of you. So I think you are bigger experts than I. <laughs> so I, I'm trying to configure JBoss application server to work with Kerberos server. So, what is Kerberos? You maybe know Fluffy, the free-headed dog from the first book of Harry Potter. He protected the entrance to to hiding place of the Philosopher's Stone. So, it is the Kerberos. And uh, it's also network authentication protocol based on symmetric cryptography. And uh, it uses tickets to identify parties in the, in the network. And there has to be uh, a trusted third party, the Kerberos server, which grants tickets to the participants. What is JBoss negotiation? It's one of the modules in JBoss application servers server and it's responsible for Kerberos authentication. Uh, it's, it implements SP or it uses SP negotiation which wraps uh, Kerberos and NTLM and it's basically, uh, it consists of three components, uh, authenticator which is Tomcat valve or we should say JBoss Web Wolf, and a uh, few login modules, and uh, also a toolkit, small web application, uh, which you can use for testing uh, your, if, if, you, if you have configured your application server correctly for Kerberos. So, uh, the, this module, this library, is already prepared in the application server, so we we can we can show how how to configure it and how to use it. Uh, there is a small web applications on my GitHub repository. You can try it, which consists which contains all necessary XML configuration files. So if you want, you can try it yourself. Uh, first of all, what you should touch is, is JBoss application server configuration file, which in the application server seven is stored in one, on one place. Uh, mainly you touch standalone XML if you use the default server. What you need to do is create two security domains. Uh, in standalone XML, you will find subsystem security part where are already prepared some security domains and you have to add two more. One, uh, which is here named uh, host, uses uh, Kerberos uh, authentication module from Java and is used for uh, JBoss, authent JBoss server authentication in the Kerberos network. Uh, here in the module properties, you can see uh, it's used non-interactive uh, authentication. So we provide KitHub file, which holds credentials, and we also specify the principle, which is something like username. 
second security domain is SPNEGO, which is used for the client authentication against the against the application server. Uh, you can see here it references the first uh, the first uh, security domain and uh, yeah it's very very simple login module which which it uses uh, login module which is stored in the jboss uh, jboss negotiation library Uh, in the standalone XML file, you also can set up some properties, for example, enable debugging, or if you want to use uh, non-system-wide uh, Kerberos configuration file, you can specify the system properties for it. So, it was all what you need on the server side. Then you have, you have to configure your Java web application to to enable uh, this uh, JBoss negotiation. So, if we look into standard uh, web application file in Java, uh, you probably know uh, there is some uh, deployment descriptor, web XML, and uh, some HTML files, JSP files. And here you can see some other more configuration files which we, we have to define. So, yeah, as I've already mentioned, there's a web XML in webinf directory where you can specify your secu uh, security constraint for the web application, so which part of application will be protected and which roles has, have access to, to the application or to part of it. Uh, in the same folder lives uh, our, our vendor specific <coughs> configuration file where we define the security domain which is used for user authentication. Yeah, you remember the one we, we defined already. And we also, in this case, have to specify a, an additional filter or this Tomcat valve or JBoss web valve and yeah, it's basically uh, an authenticator. It's, it's the same mechanism as is used for form authentication or basic authentication. Uh, yeah, but in this case, you have to uh, specify it. And the last file which you have to create or change is JBoss deployment structure, which lives in MetaInf folder. And here we specify dependencies on JBoss application server modules. Yeah, so it's used for class loading, and we we can either to define 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 it in this JBoss deployment structure file, or we can use Meta uh, manifest MF file but everybody likes XML, so we use XML files to, to define these dependencies. So it's all, and your application is JBoss enabled, or uh, JBoss negotiation enabled, so you can use Kerberos for authentication. And the last step, you have to configure also uh, your client to to be able to to communicate with with the application so what you need you need some uh, you need to configure your operating system mostly you will touch uh, etc kerber5.conf where you will add some uh, some realm you, you will define uh, kerberos server and uh, uh, you can either say it's a default realm or you can say for the domain or localhost use this uh, this realm 
uh, if you don't want to touch this etc uh, file uh, you can you can use uh, property curb5 config uh, which which can point to another to to an alternative file uh, you should also enable Kerberos, Kerberos authentication in the browser for the local host or, or domain. So it, it differs for, uh, for the browsers. Yeah, you have to read documentation. And if it still doesn't work, then there are some problematic area. One of them is service uh, or principal name of of the of the JBoss application server. Uh, if you use this HTTP, then the the host name should have this form. Uh, so HTTP slash then canonical name the name which is requested. Uh, for example, this in most cases will not work. Yeah, you will define HTTP slash localhost and then user comes through HTTP uh, 127.001. So yeah, this, is, this can be a problem and you will, you will not get into the application. Another problem can be with IPv6. Uh, mainly if you use use the SPNego login module together with Kerberos uh, Kerberos login modules which loads roles from LDAP server then yeah, you can see there there is different different uh, service name used yeah, here is URL type or you know the square brackets used for HTTP, but they are not used for LDAP principal name. So it's another problematic area. And yeah, if you want to use IBM Java, there are more problems, and you have to enable debugger and try and try. So it's all, and. Maybe, yeah, I, I can show you. How, how the demo application looks like. If it works. <laughs> yeah, it's only three, uh, there are only three pages one unauthorized and two with protected access and if we go to user page we are not uh, we didn't log in into the Kerberos so we can fix it log into Kerberos as some sample user The Duke is the password. Let's try it again. And to our we are authorized to view user page because our user has uh, the correct roles and also an admin page. There are more test users, so you can
Okay, how long is it? Oh, okay. That's actually pretty generous. Yeah, that's more like a, like a, a thunder talk or a rumbling talk. All right, good to go. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you how to make docs fun. Um, who likes writing docs? I don't need to look because I know nobody is raising their hand. Um, so we had a, this, this comes out of an um, inter interesting experience with the Arachillian project. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was make it possible for, well, we just basically avoid the pain of writing docs. We needed to write tutorials. So we wrote them in, we looked at different lightweight markup languages, uh, markdown. That was one of them that we looked at. Textile was what we ultimately chose, but still wasn't quite right. Uh, and what we realized is that we needed, we needed the power of DocBook, but we didn't want the pain of doing XML. So we decided that we were going to um, drop the angle brackets, but not lose the semantics that you would get from DocBook. And just have fun writing docs. And, and make docs uh, you know, a productive experience, but also a, a rewarding and, and, and uh, fun depending on whether you you know the ideas are coming out of your mind or whether you're li literally pulling every single idea out like you're ripping out your hair but this this is how writing goes so w basically we believe that writing in docbook is just inhumane uh, if you look at um, docbook whether it be as an editor or someone trying to merge in changes uh, this just wasn't uh, something that humans were intended to do so the author of ASCII doc uh, starts out the user guide for ASCII doc with this quote, which I really think it just hits it right on the head. He said, look, I'm, I'm spending more time trying to fix syntax errors in XML. And the other thing is indentation. So you, know, you give someone XML, and it's like the, giving them one of those cards where it says, um, turn it over to see what's on the other side. And on the other side, it says, turn it over to see what's on the other side, right? And this is basically what ends up happening in XML. You're, you're spending more time indenting the shit than you are working on what it's wrapping. So what we just want to, we just want to write, damn it. Okay, we don't want all this crap. So the question is, how often do we, do we write? And we'll think about it for a second. Think about your day and how much you write during the day. And you're probably spending about 70 to 80% of your day writing. You're writing something. You're writing code. You're writing emails. You're writing social media, Twitter, probably Twitter mostly. But, uh, so we're writing all the time. But what, do we, you know, what syntax do we use when we write that? Well, we just use um, our own language. That's what we use. Right? So we want to be able to just write. So enter ASCII doc. So ASCII doc is a, it's a lightweight markup language akin to markdown. But it goes way, way, way beyond Markdown. I, I like to say that um, you know, Markdown is really something that's an, intended for um, perhaps something pretty quick. Uh, and it just so happens you're using a subset of the ASCII doc format. So basically, when you're writing in Markdown, you're writing in ASCII doc, just not using all the power. And the real thing um, that sets ASCII doc apart is that it was trying to replace the need of typing the XML parts of DocBook. So that's why it is as complete as it is, because from the very beginning, it was looking at the ASCII doc, uh, sorry, at the DocBook tags and saying, well, how can I get the ability to type that tag? How can I generate DocBook that has those tags? So it, it had the, right, the type of focus that we need from a technical documentation perspective. And it has what I like to call mild punctuation, right? You, you, you have to add some extra stuff to the text that you're writing, the language that you're communicating. But where else do we do that? Well, let's say that you want to write a, a tweet or you want to write an email and you want to yell at somebody. So what do you do? Well, you put asterisks around it, right? So it's very natural to have done that anyway. Um, although you just gave me the idea that if you wrote in all uppercase, perhaps I could render that as you screaming. But yeah, it's picking up on conventions that we've used in the computer industry for 20 years, you know, develop these things, and say, let's make a, a formal language out of that. So but you type it, and of course, you're not going to render it that way. 
although it is very readable, you certainly don't want to present your user documentation in raw ASCII doc format or raw markdown format or whatever. You want to render it out. So of course, you would expect that it can do HTML. And a lot of markup languages stop here. That's it. They can do HTML. And the trouble here is, well, what if, what if you want to put this into a documentation pipeline? Uh, what if HTML can't be the first format? It, you need to export that to something that's consumable. Well, not everyone in the world is going to be writing an ASCII doc parser, but a lot of things understand docbook, so it would be really brilliant if we could get docbook out of this. No pain of typing XML tags, but it is a good transport format. I mean, I guess you could argue that if you had a, um, for web services, you know, you're transferring XML over the, over the wire, and okay, I, we don't want to type XML, but it actually works out pretty well to be able to transfer that to someone, because everyone in the world has parses for this stuff. So a lot of docbook stuff. Um, okay, we might want to have something to take offline, so a PDF or an EPUB. How about a man page? Uh, if you've ever looked at you know, writing a man page, uh, you probably decide just not to. And if you could write a man page by just typing some text and saying, make a man page out of that text, this would be brilliant. So it can do that. And, and things like ODF. And then slides. So where can you see ASCII-Doc in the wild? Well, if you go to um, a GitHub page, so if you go to a GIST or a, um, any file in a repository or on their wiki, you'll notice that ASCII-Doc is an option in the dropdown. The implementation of ASCII doc that's running on GitHub is uh, a version of ASCII doc called ASCII doctor that I just finished writing over the last three months. So GitHub is running Red Hat community code for rendering ASCII doc. So that's pretty fun. So the other, there's another project. If you want to see a project that's using ASCII doc heavily, a Neo4j is a great project because they're doing all kinds of innovative stuff. And they have kind of the same goals that the Archelian project has in mind, which is trying to automate the shit out of everything in the project. Okay? And they're doing a lot of it through ASCII doc. So the, one of the guys, the community um, documentation writers, Anders, he said, you know, he's amazed by ASCII doc. It handles a lot of use cases well. And the thing that I like, is that, but that second part. Because of course, when you're showing off something, it always does what you're showing off, because why else would you be standing there? But when people leave and try to use it, it can't do the other stuff that they need. And so what's really interesting is that every use case that seems to come forward, we get, we pull to that second sentence to say, hey, at least it's still possible to do all that other stuff. So for instance, if you need a new tag, you want to do like a key combination or a menu, um, a menu selection in your documentation. Well, that isn't in the ASCII doc format, but you can write a custom macro that understands how to do that. So you can extend the language. Markdown, for instance, it will never change. It is markdown. That's what it is. It's not going to change. But ASCII doc was designed from the very beginning to anticipate the fact that we, we're not going to put every possible uh, syntax into the language out of the box, but we'll give you the way to do it. So the family, I probably could have put this earlier, but the family that we're in, um, markdown, textile, restructured text, et cetera, you may have seen some of these things. I, I want to point, pick on restructured text a little bit. So restructured text and, and um, ASCII doc have very similar goals in mind, basically to try to be lightweight markup language, but have all the features of an advanced publishing pipeline. And but what I, what I dislike about restructured text uh, is that no one in their right mind would have ever come up with the syntax that they used to, to mark up the language. Unfortunately, they selected it for write the docs, which is a great community resource, kind of like the GitHub for documentation, but they chose restructured text. So I don't want to put my community through that. I want to pick something that they would have like, naturally typed. And so that's why, out of all of these, ASCII doc is the one that I'm standing here talking about. So let's do a quick showdown. Just give you some familiarity of what it's like. So this is a basic ASCII doc document. Uh, you can see it has a title. Second and third line is author and revision line, respectively. And then paragraphs are just paragraphs. Um, a section, there are a couple of different ways to a markup to do the sections. I prefer what they call the um, SE text style, which is just equal signs are equal to the number of nesting levels y your heading is. So this is a second level heading. And then stars, uh, asterisks for the, the bullets. Okay, let's look at what that is in DocBook. 
Okay, there's page one, uh, there's page two, and there's page three. So exact same content, and one fits on a slide and one doesn't even come close. So um, I like to say that you know, Markdown is a first grader, ASCII doc is a PhD student, uh, doc book is for aliens. So I want to show you real quick, I'm going to drop out of the slides, I want to show you another nice thing that I've been working on here it, to make editing very pleasant. So okay, you can see that, okay, it wants to do this, come on. Get friendly with that side, come on now. All right, it doesn't want to do it, we're going to do it the manual way. Meta and right. Meta and right. Uh, yeah, yeah. No. Sorry. All right, we just need to move that to the side so it's not in our way. All right, so um, one of the things I thought about was, and people ask this a lot, is that, okay, I'm editing it, but I still want to be able to see kind of how it's playing out. And so ASCII doc can convert directly to HTML, so it doesn't have any other tool other than ASCII doc itself. So I can use, um, it, I should mention, ASCII Doctor is written in Ruby. So uh, I want to be able to edit, and while I'm editing, and I want to see a preview of what I'm doing over here. So I wrote a, a plugin for Guard. Now, Guard is just a wrapper around iNotify. And as I'm editing, so I can say, like, let's, we'll see if it shows up. And you can see at the bottom, yeah, you can only see Bruno, but yeah. So it, um, what it's doing is it watching for file system changes, and as soon as it, it sees it, it just runs ASCII, doc, dar, uh, ASCII doctor on it again, and then shows the preview, and it's sending the differences to the browser, but the scroll offset doesn't get messed up. So you can literally get what I call WYSIWYG of the future, which is syntax with live preview, because WYSIWYG failed, and it doesn't work for documentation. It creates garbage. This creates exactly what you want, but gives you that same experience of being able to preview. Um, I want to emphasize one other type of syntax. So one of the things that ASCII doc, uh, ASCII doc syntax got really, really right was tables. And tables tend to look really, really bad in something like a lightweight markup language. And what Stuart came up with was basically that a table is a delimited block. So delimited blocks have four characters of something at the top and bottom of the content. And then pipe separated, which is kind of the accepted thing for lightweight uh, for doing tables. But what's interesting about its tables is that it's not sensitive to the lines. So you can actually put the pipes wherever you want. So one of the things that I am recommending is that you actually look at table rows as lists like this, right? And then you see that every row is just a set of pipe marked lists. Okay? And so this is important because it speaks to the, I can read the ASCII doc source, and I don't need to see it rendered. And I can still get the, the information out. So there you go. If you render it, and then it does like a nice little table here. So I really, really like that, that idea. It just shows, I could show you all, this, all the syntax, but I could show you this, and you get the idea that it was designed to be able to read the, the source code. So maybe I could just publish the ASCII doc, right? You can actually, there's a, um, um, a, a style sheet, apparently, that will, will mark up Markdown and whatever as HTML, but it renders it as the source. So I don't know. Maybe if you feel you know, like real Emacs or VI, you can forget that HTML thing and just go with text. So that's, that, that's a, a, a quick tour. I want to skip through some of this stuff because for a longer presentation, I show all the, the syntax. We'll get to the point here. Um, and then kind of I think the thing that really hits home with developers is this idea that source is actually something that matters. Okay, so you can just type plain source code right into the document, and you don't have to escape any characters that look like they might interfere with your XML, and bang you're good to go, it'll syntax highlight. You can also include relative files. So without, uh, right, drop the angle brackets, but not the semantics. Uh, choose ASCII doc to write your uh, formats.
uh, your documentation. Thank you. Um, I have, what do you say? And music. Yeah. I, um, I have only 15 minutes for quite an ambitious uh, undertaking here. Um, so uh, let me close this thing. And go here. So, um, what I want to do uh, during the 15 minutes is uh, I want to create a JPA project. I want to use an existing database that is on my disk, reverse engineer the database, scaffold a, user inter a, a JSF user interface for the entities that have been reverse engineered, deploy the web app locally, test it, and then push everything into the cloud to open ship, right? So, um, the the, the thing that, that will probably cause the most time is the last part, right? the last line. So if I'm, not, um, if I'm not in time, that will be the reason. Great. Um, I, um, I have here, before we start, I will show you uh, on my disk, I have a file called uh, sakila.h2.db, which is a database which contains data. We can quickly uh, connect to it here. Um, oh, crash. Wow. <laughs> Let's reopen this thing. Okay. So, uh, in this database, we have a few tables. Well, Quite a few, actually, 18 or 20 or something like that. And there is content in the in the in these tables, right? Okay. So um, close this application. Yes. And to do this, I'm going to use Forge. Uh, I don't know if people were here in the earlier talk about Forge. Uh, Forge is a command line tool that enables you to issue commands uh, and um, set up things fairly quickly, as you will see. Right, so the first thing that we need to do is um, create a new project. Uh, and I will call the project, oh yeah, let me first um, do this. So in Forge, uh, if you create commands or issue commands, uh, some points they, um, Forge will ask you uh, for certain choices. Uh, um, to save some time, I will just accept all the defaults, right? Okay, so let's create this new uh, project. Uh, it's called Sakila. Okay, or there it is. The pro project is created here. Okay, uh, it's a simple, mavenized uh, project. Um, I'm going to uh, set up persistence because I need I need to reverse engineer entities, so I need persistence for this. So I'm going to set up persistence. The provider is Hibernate, and the container is JBoss EAP6. OK. So everything is uh, set up. So I have a persistence.xml file with uh, a data source. And yeah, I forgot to mention this. I have this uh, JBoss EAP uh, running here in my uh, JBDS environment. OK. So um, that's the first part. Now, I told you I want to reverse engineer uh, data from a database. So to do this, I'm going to use a, a Forge plugin 
which is uh, using Hibernate tools. So it's called the Hibernate tools plugin, and it provides two uh, commands. The first command is connection profiles because I'm going to I'm going to use a connection profile to save time. And I actually have uh, a, a Sakila connection profile that is already defined. As you can see, there is a dialect, a Hibernate dialect, a driver class, a location for the driver, uh, and a, a URL, which actually points to the the file that I uh, that I showed you in the very beginning, uh, where that contains all the data. Okay, so I'm going to use the second command that. Uh, uh, the Hibernate Tools plugin provides is generate entities. And I'm gonna, just going to use the connection profile Sakila that I have defined there. Right? OK. There it is. So all these entities are created. Now I'm going to scaffold the user interface. So I first have to set up scaffolding. Um, scaffold setup. Right. <laughs> All right, it's set up. And now I'm going to uh, scaffold from entity. And I'm going to use wildcards to scaffold everything in one go. There we go. So now it's generating the UI for all these different entities. There we go. So there is one more thing that I need to do. Um, I, I have this file. Um, so you can see that there is a, a data source here that is used, which is a default database, and that my Hibernate uh, HBM to DDL is uh, create drop. I cannot use create drop, otherwise it will just erase the database that, I'm, that, I, that I started with. So I will use update there, update. I will change this data source into a data source called Sakila, and then I need to do one more thing, and that is copy a file. Uh, CP. Um, so in next to this data file here, I have a file called Sakila-ds.xml, which contains the definition of the data of the data source that I will deploy with my application, and so I have to copy that in the webinf uh, folder. Um, right, deployed resources right here, right? So that is uh, src slash main slash web app web inf. Okay, so here it is. And to show you, so this is just. Um, a definition of a data source here. The name is the one that I uh, I am using in my persistence.xml, and it connects to the to the local file that I that I have uh, th that is on my local disk. Right. Okay. So we're there. I can just um, now select this one and say, "Hey, run this guy on the server." Okay. Run it on the server there. It starts to deploy this, and if everything goes well, there is a browser that opens, and we have actors. You can see the data that uh, that we had in our local database. They uh, we can see them in our um, in our uh, in our browser. Yeah. Okay. We need to. Uh, Okay, so so far so good. Now we have to um, push this thing to open shift, right? That's what I promised. So the first thing that I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to create an open shift application. I have uh, a pane here called JBoss Central, which makes this thing very easy. So I will just select open shift application. Everything is set up, so it, it verifies the credentials. It um, loads cartridges and so on, right? And I'm going to create a new application on OpenShift called Sakila. It's going to be a JBoss AFP6 application, of course, because that's the one that I'm using, um, uh, that I'm using in, um, 
locally. And I'm going to um, use an existing project, namely the Sakila project that I have uh, created. Okay. So now, um, what happens now it can take some time. If we're lucky, then uh, everything will, will go right. So now it, it, it is actually contacting uh, the OpenShift server and creating the application over there. Any questions until now? Might as well <laughs> kill some time. Not yet, no, not yet. That's actually a good point. So yeah, I might explain that now. So I need actually this, this data, this local data that are here. I need to upload them to the server, right? But I don't know where the server is yet, right? I don't have any address to upload it to. So I need to wait until the application has been created by OpenShift to determine where to upload the data. All right. Some changes. Ah. It timed out. So let's see if something uh, has been created. Oh, OK. All right. So something has been created. Um, it asks for my local key because it, it, it needs to set up get, uh, get uh, authentication. So. And it clones the application. And now I have here, if everything goes well, I have, so I created a backup for <laughs> where things would go wrong. But I have created this uh, Sakila application. I can actually uh, look at the files that, uh, at, uh, you know, at the tail. Uh, I can tail the, the, the output of this uh, of the server, and I can also uh, determine the details. And here you see the Git URL, and it's exactly this Git URL that I will use to upload this data that I was talking about. So. Um, Okay, this doesn't work. SCP. Um, oh, what is this? Why is this wireless twenty two twenty seven? All right, so this is uh, apparently not going to uh, not going to work for some reason. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know what is wrong with that. Um, I should upload this uh, these data to my uh, to to the OpenShift uh, server, and then I would be able to uh, just. Um, Open a web browser on uh, Sakila, not Sakila backup. That's the backup thing that I that I've created, but the normal Sakila uh, um, server, and you would see the same uh, the same data or the same the the web application would have the same uh, characteristics as the one that was locally deployed. All right. Okay. Any questions? Well, you, you can you have the code, right? The code is uh, local, so you can just you can just edit it and change it. Oh, it's fairly readable, actually. It No. 
I mean, there is so for for each entity there is a there there is a number of facelets that are have been generated, and then you have uh, you have in the uh, here the entities right that have been created, and there is backed beans for JSF here in this package, and that's it. So it's just standardized J, uh, uh, JSF, a standardized J JSF application. There's nothing magical. Oh, you wouldn't. Yeah, no. So there's no uh, no no uh, cycles. You have to just regenerate everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think we run out of time, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. As expected. <laughs> So hello everyone. As you see, I'm not from Red Hat. Well, you can call me Black Hat. My last name is Cherny, so that's how you will remember me. But you might refer me like this uh, later tonight when you will have some questions and you will like to discuss something. And I'm very happy that I can present you here uh, something what we work on. We work it um, work on this project quite a long time. Uh, we already also have it deployed in some production applications, and it will be related to the user interface. And I take the advantage of the previous two talks uh, because one of them said, I like to see what I'm doing right away from the documentation. Well, we will be right away be able to see the user interface what we are presenting. And the second presentation that was here, coming just after, uh, there was a generation of user interface, and perhaps uh, it might be done even more advanced the user interface might integrate some addition things. So the content of this talk, it's quite longer, but I will speak very quickly. So I will tell you something about why user interface development is very complex, but I'm sure you already know that. And then perhaps how an adaptive user interface look, could look like. And I know why you are not developing it, because it would be too much maintenance, but I will show you how to make it easy to maintain and easy to develop. Then we look at the enterprise Java, uh, Java Enterprise Edition architecture. You already know it, but it's about how do we adapt to it because we don't want you to reinvent the wheel. Then I will introduce you our technology aspect faces that does all these things for you. I will mention some of the advantages. Mostly we will look at the performance. And perhaps at the beginning, I might say something why you should listen to this. Well, we have uh, the uh, technology in production application that is quite large and we are saving 32% of UI code, which is a reasonable number, which might motivate you why you should be interested in this, because you don't want to develop manually information on multiple places, multiple times. You want to reduce the maintenance and you don't want to touch it again. You want to have it uh, automated. Then we will mention some future work and related work and we will discuss perhaps some references and then you will see more. So. I might ask how ever of you uh, somehow touched some UI code, most of you I believe, but I believe that none of you likes to maintain it. I believe that none of you likes to develop, let's say, user interface forms. Or is there someone who does like it? That's a better question because the lazy people don't raise the hand and most of the people say, yes, we agree with you. So, but Let's look more into it. So why is UI important? Because this is what attracts our users. It's the communication between our system and the user. And certainly it should look attractive, it should reflect the system, it should enforce validation, it should enforce all the information. 
users should understand it, but at the same time, you don't like to develop it because it's too much replication from what you already captured in a data model. It's information what you captured in validation rules and it's information that you captured already somewhere else. So we want to have low maintenance in very often type unsafe languages because if you develop in J JSF and in facelets, you know that it is kind of type unsafe. So if you make a mistake in the data model and in user interface, it will scream too late. The user will see that. So what if I will motivate you with this? All you need to do to the, uh, present this form in your user interface is to type these two lines. You just pass it to the entity and you say, I want it editable. Or you say, I don't want it editable. I wonder something else. So this is what, I, what the aim of this presentation is. We can reduce the user interface forms into something simple like that. So how do we do that? So before, uh, let's start what you normally do. You normally take the shortest path. Instead of seeing all the different types of users, you just define one single user interface and you will say, I want this one user interface for all my users. And it must serve it. But most likely, you would like to consider some additional things that come into your path. So for example, does the user support large user interface? Can he offer some wider layout or smaller layout? Well, it's not that simple. You could certainly use some basic layout tool. But what if you need to skip some fields? What if you need a space here? So this is certainly something you would like to offer your user in case you would have the technology that wouldn't cost you. That wouldn't cost you the development time. That wouldn't cost you the maintenance. So what do we have here next? Well, we have four different users. Perhaps all of those should consider the use of our application. And perhaps all four of those users should receive different user interface for the same data. It's the same data model. It's the same data we require for them. But it's a different presentation to those users. Well, will you support this in your application? The answer is no, because you don't want to maintain it. You don't want to develop those things. Well, I will show you later that it's not that hard to develop those things. So what do we see from this? We present a different things, different layout, different presentation, but most likely we don't do that because it is expensive. It's a lot of code. So we will be re reducing it. What other concerns we might consider? Perhaps if we have a user from different location, uh, let's say from US, then I will require uh, to fill in a state. But if I'm from the Czech Republic, we don't have states. So perhaps the user interface should adapt to those things. We might filter some things. There is a student, and uh, the student might provide information when he started the study. And if there is no student, we shouldn't ask him to provide this information. Perhaps you don't want to show some uh, fields in the user interface. You might show them only as read only. And where do you do this? I already show you, you have multiple layouts, you have multiple presentations. How many times you will restate this information? Most likely in user interface. So it would be better to have a single focal point of information definition. And this information should be enforced in all your presentations. And this is the direction we will be heading into. So let's look in a more theoretical part. We have cross-cutting concerns. Certainly you will agree with me that there is a difference with field presentation, with the layout, perhaps with the security, with the do. Uh, data binding with input validation and so on and so on. But we have one dimensional language, mostly when we have markup languages. So what do we do? We just will write it in one long fragment. How do you reuse this fragment? Well, most likely you will not reuse this fragment because it's too complicated. But if we manage to define those things separately, most likely you will be able to reuse this information and let someone to compose this. Let some library compose to do those things for you. And you will most likely reduce from this. So what do we know? Well, we know that there is a problem in user interface that most of the time they use uh, type unsafe languages, which requires from you to restate the information, field name, cont uh, um, entity name, and so on. And you are receiving tons of code for something that you would do in case you would support adaptive user um, interface. So we want to reduce this. We want to define all those things separately. And we want you to have a very low maintenance requirements. So let's look at the enterprise architecture. Well, most likely you already know that, right? So what do we know about the forms? The forms will always represent the data model. It's quite easy. The forms uh, will most likely reflect the information that you have in the annotations. So what do you normally do? You retype this information, you restate it, and perhaps this information is accessible. Perhaps these forms should be generated from somewhere. This information should be reused rather than restated manually because it uh, enforces it. And you are aware of having no error in the user interface. 
if you do that automatically instead of manual. So how do we do this? Well, let's look at this technology. It will be quite easy, and I'm promising you that it will uh, save you a lot of time and a lot of effort when you're developing the user interface and you're maintaining it. So the trick is to split all those different aspects in different dimensions. So how do we do that? This is your architecture, this is your application. We already, what do we do? We will inspect the data model that you have. We will suck the information that is already captured there. We will build, build ad hoc a meta model. From this meta model, we can suck whatever information you want. You can type your own annotations, and we will still suck it. We will understand what it is. What next? Well, perhaps this meta model should be filtered, because some of the fields shouldn't be shown in the user interface, because they are secure, because they are not valid for the user interface, or some whatever other reasons. What next? Well, we would like to take this meta model, and we would like to transform it somehow, perhaps with aspect-oriented way. Well, it is possible, because we can really address those things. So we will take the meta model, we will define a transformation rules that are generic, because you know every time when you have annotation email on your field that it's most likely going to be validated as email address. So you will define this just once, not all the time, whenever you are restating your um, user interface. So we will get this, we will make it in runtime, the weaver will be responsible for the transformation, and what do you receive? Well, you will receive something that you will be happy with, because you will receive user interface that adapts to your data model, and that adapts to your uh, context in the runtime, because the context can also influence those decisions in your mapping rules. So you will be receiving a user interface for a given user that you want. <clears throat> Let's look what do we have next. Well, here are some of the examples. So I've shown you, here is a simple form. We will show you much more if you will come to see us tomorrow at 12.30. We have a lab, so we will have plenty of time to explain you all those details. Or you can look on the showcase aspectfaces.com. And if you have computer in front of you, do that, because it's quite nice how you will see how much code you can reduce. So what else? Well, we would like to add layout. So we add layout. That's all we need to do. What do we want to do next? Well, we would like to ignore some fields. So either you can uh, globally ignore those things, or you can contextually, just from the code form, say, I don't want these fields to be there. What can uh, you do else? Well, you can say some of the fields are certainly not going to be, in this case, shown as uh, writable. So we will show them only as read-only, et cetera, et cetera. Well, most likely, you will also come up into, I have multiple uh, instances that I want to show at the same time. So we just put there multiple instances. And much more. You can see there <coughs> much more things. We can generate tables. We can generate whatever you want. Perhaps we could be generating this ASCII doc. Well, we don't have inspection for that, but we could. So sh see the showcases, and you will see what other options are there. So perhaps what do you want to say now? That's going to be slow. Yeah. No, it's not slow. We have it deployed in a production application that has 70 tables approximately that is being hit from all around the world. And here is our statistics that we got. So for, for the form that has six fields, in average, we are 5% worse uh, to render it than when we would write it manually. But in case this form has some restricted fields, normally you would do not to render some field in the UI. If you use our technology, you are actually receiving perhaps closer and closer into something that you might receive a better performance. So what do you need to use? Not much. You are reusing the information already in your data model. You are uh, defining uh, some very easy templates that looks like facelets. In fact, the output is in facelets, and we compile it in runtime. Uh, you might use some uh, expression language marks, which are very easy because it's nothing new. You already know that. So you say, I want to use prime faces. Use prime faces. These are the templates. Just use the templates. I want to use rich faces. I want to use something new, cool faces. Use it. Just define your templates and um, propagate the information from the data model. It's very easy. You have your own templates. So what next you can receive here? Well, you would like to see some results. So here is this application that we were measuring. It has in total uh, 77,000 lines of code of Java. In HTML and XML, it has approximately 33,000 lines of code. And what we don't do, we don't write our own forms. We generate them. And if we would write them, it would be approximately 21,000 lines of code of XHTML, which contains approximately 15,592 restated informations. It's quite like a large number. Just imagine now that you change one field in your data model, and you have to go somewhere. Where do you go? You don't know. You have, to, you have to have some naming conventions to find it out. But with this approach, 
it is being automatically propagated. So you know when you change the data field, it right away updates the user interface because this whole process is in runtime. So you can in runtime change it. If you like JRebel, you might get kind of evilish, and you will have JRebel, you will be changing fields, and you will see that right away on your screen how it changes. You don't need to recompile it, and you don't need to push it there. So it's quite easy to play with it. So what is the future work we have? Well, we want to integrate it with rules, and we have it as a diploma thesis, which is coming soon from Karel, who is sitting there, and who will mention a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, we have Zdeněk, who already has a prototype of application that from this can generate uh, PDF, can generate Excel. So no more code involved. You just use it, and you have this advantage. There is a validation framework uh, that can change the conditionals. You know that if you want to validate in some context something and in some context something else, it's not that easy. So Zdeněk also wrote a, a small library for this. Uh, JavaScript library, uh, Lukáš is responsible for that and also writing some HTML5 components with a responsive design. So he might tell you a little bit about it. Here is a research we did. So it's something we do quite a long time, already five years. And perhaps you want to see yourself, perhaps you want to come tomorrow, or perhaps you want me to show a little bit of what we have. If anyone received the tokens for the party but is not planning to go, uh, there are people outside who would like some. So if you can just leave it on the table, that would be great. Just in case you would like no, not to go to the party. So if I can steal a little bit uh, more minutes of your time, here is the demo. The demo shows you what you need to type, and here is actually a quick guide. This is the line of code. When you are presenting something, you want to ignore a field. You directly see it reduce some fields. You want to render some fields. They will render in, with AJAX. You can say some fields are read-only. You can have multiple instances that you combine together. You can <clears throat> use the same thing for table. You can iterate over it. You have both approaches. Well, with AJAX, there is much more fun that you can do. So I type something on Blur, it changes into a Jonah. Well, we can also look at the layout things. So if you look at a dynamic layout, I have form presented in one field, two, uh, two, two columns, three columns. And this is just a simple layout. Well, there is much more things. So if you will look into something, and this is just a sandbox. So if there happens some error, just consider that this is not a production application. But it has some nice features. So let's say I will detect uh, capabilities of my user interface. And because here is low resolution, I only receive two columns. But perhaps I would like to customize it. And it also sees that I'm from Brno, so it will not be presenting me information related to the United States. If I will say that uh, I will force the email address uh, to be from the United States, it should be showing a home state in addition to that. Well, this is not that cool, right? But what if I say that I'm child? Suddenly, the user interface changes into something saying, I'm a child, I'm an elderly. Well, I'm not professional on making user interface looks nicely, but I like to play with it. Well, of course, there is many more things. Let's say that I will be a student, and I will present a white screen. Now I have layout of three. And I will also say, uh, when I said that I'm a student, it also presented me this, this box of the student information. What else we could do? Well, we could play with it. We could say there is some specific moods that I'm focused. It will just put everything close to it together. But I think that you are getting the picture from it. So uh, you want to have something that is quite nice for the user, that adapts to it, and you don't want to maintain it. You want to have it as few code as possible, as few lines. And come tomorrow at 12.30. We will show you how you can use it. We will be happy to answer all your questions. And hopefully you will like it. And we will be very happy for your feedback because it's also a university research that we does. And it's also something that we use in production. And perhaps you will give us a good hint to improve it. Go ahead. It's not open source, but it's free to use for open source. Perhaps answer you didn't like, but that's how it is currently. Uh, how many lines of code? I don't know. And the dependencies. Dependencies. Well, you will just need Maven, and it will have 
Trump dependencies, so approximately <laughs> uh, six circle? six libraries. You will need three 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 more libraries. So dependency is not a big. So if you will say, well, I have project in Spring, you can use it in Spring. All you need is JPA. You need some annotations and. Pretty much, you could have project in XML, but we don't have XML inspector, but we have API so that you can define XML inspector. You can say, I have my custom annotations because I just love them. Well, you will just say, use those, and you can propagate them. You can put them in a context, and you can hook them directly to the user interface. So it should be as much adaptable as, as you will find it useful. Well, yeah, yeah, and guys, I will also be at the party, so I will have this hat because it's too big, so I'll have it on my hat. So find me and talk with me. <laughs>